they could do. But on the boat, the men asked him, what could they do? Jonah was very happy to cry against the city. But Jonah wasn't happy that he knew that there was a God that if they repented, that he would relent. And what he left out was, if you repent. There's nowhere in the scripture where it says, he said, well, if y'all repent, he's not going to do this. All he did was cry against the city. He went from city to city, town to town, corner to corner, and cried out against it in a loud voice that the city is going to be destroyed within 40 days. Go ahead. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. So you got, you got Nineveh hearing the cry of condemnation, hearing the cry of judgment against them, and then you have them believing and repenting. You have them believing and repenting. You have them believe what he said, the doom, and then turning to God that they did not know and repent. So God honors the repentance of a sinner. They were the example of us. Yes. We hear God's word, and God gives us an ear to hear. Faith come by hearing. Hearing came by the word of God. God opened their ears to hear, and they repented. And Jonah has the best record of any evangelist on the planet. A whole nation got saved. That has never been done before. From the, from the top to the bottom, from the richest to the poorest, from the king's house to the outhouse, everybody got saved. And the king commanded for the, for the salvation of the Lord, because it belongs to the Lord, as we heard, he commanded that they do a ritual, which was sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth and ashes. They decided to repent. And God, in his mercy and his grace, decided to show a heathen nation that had been so cruel to his people. He decided to repent, to relent from the destruction of Nineveh, just like he did before. But they just got one prophet. Just think about this, saints. They just got one prophet. They didn't have a whole bunch of prophets because 100 years later, if you read Nahum, they did get destroyed because they had turned their back on God. But God, Jesus, it tells us, go to, go, I want you to see something. Go to uh, Matthew 23 and 33. Start there. Jesus tells us that the Jews, and we're just like the Jews because we actually have more than the Jews have to turn to God. Start there. Matthew 23 and 33. Uh-huh. You serpents, mm -hmm. you brood of vipers, mm -hmm. how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. How many? Prophets, wise men, and scribes. And what do they do? Some of whom you will kill and mm -hmm. crucify. Mm -hmm. And some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. So God is saying, I sent the Jews. I sent you guys, many prophets, many scribes, many wise men. And basically, you will ignore them. And some you will kill and flog and hurt. Because you don't want to hear the message. Why don't you want to hear the message? John 3.19. Men prefer darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. How many times does God have to knock on your door? Before you answer, yes and amen. Go ahead. No, read that. Finish reading. Okay. So that you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Barakia, mm -hmm. whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. These are the good Jew folks. These are the good Christian folks that murdered God's prophets and God's priests. Go ahead. Truly I say to you, mm -hmm. all these things will come upon this generation. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, the difference between the Ninevites, they were willing. The difference between the Jews and, and receiving the prophets, the scribes, the scriptures, they were not willing. The difference between the Ninevites, 
they were willing. They heard one man with the word of God. The difference between them and the church is we got a whole bunch of people preaching and teaching, but we got the majority of people not hearing. We're not, we're not hearing because if we were hearing, we wouldn't be where we're at as a whole. If we were all preaching repentance and sin and saving and the gospel of Jesus Christ versus the social gospel of God wants to make you happy, then we would have the, the, the results of the gospel. But since we're preaching another gospel, which is, which is a sin, then what we get is the seed of what we planted. See, the, the, the thing about it is, how long do we as the church realize that we have everything we need to believe in God and everything we need to, to, to walk upright before God. We even have the sacrifice which they didn't have as Jews, which is God himself, Jesus in the flesh. We should be like the Ninevites. One, one time we hear the word of God, know it's the pure word of God, then we all repent. Go back to the Ninevites. And that's what I want you to think about today. How many times does God have to come to you? Are you like Jonah? That you got to be put in peril. You got to go through all this trouble. Some of you come to the altar with the same thing every time. And you wonder what's going on. You're not being obedient to the, to the light that you have. You want more light but you're still walking in darkness. But you want more light to impress who? Yourself and others. Jonah had to be humbled. Jonah had to be broken. Jonah had to die. And so do you. You don't have to go in the fish but you got to die to self. To be a servant of God. Go ahead. Go John, yeah. Okay, verse 7. Mm -hmm. He issued a proclamation and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Yes. Do not let them eat or drink water. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly. That each may turn from his wicked way. What you say, turn from what? From his wicked way. But somewhere in this Bible tells us that if my people are called by my name, shall do what? Turn. Turn. That word turn, when you see in the Old Testament, turn from your wicked ways means repent. If they will turn and seek God earnestly, does it say that in that fashion? Yeah. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and, and, and God's righteousness? Yeah. If we turn from our wicked ways, the people are called by my name. These are people that are not called by his name, but they have enough God in them and enough sense in them to turn and seek God earnestly. Not their pagan God, but the true and living God. Go ahead. And from the violence which is in his hands, mm -hmm. who knows God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger. So that we will not perish. So what they did was rely on the kindness and the mercy of God. And they did not presume that God was going to save them. What they hoped was that the God of what they heard about, the merciful God, would actually save them because they deserved, because of their wickedness, to have this proclamation against them. Jonah knew that they were wicked. Jonah knew that probably back in his day when he was a child that he watched his parents, his, his kinfolk get taken away by the Syrians. He knew how evil and brutal they were, but God wanted to save them. And that's the kind of God we serve. God wants to save the worst of us to show that he's God. So we're in a situation now where some of the worst of us are, being, are, are, are on display. And people, and, 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 it's, and it's showing how how much you don't understand the word of God, because you want something to happen to the worst of us. But see, when you want something to happen to the worst of us, you also want something to happen to yourself, because you don't get to determine what's worse. God does, and because God is rich in mercy and grace, He wants to shed His love abroad for everyone. He desires that all should be saved. But it's us that desire that a certain folk and a certain look and a certain way and they have to do a certain thing to be saved. That's not the gospel. The gospel is for all those who would believe. And John has said they are, they are perishing because they don't believe already. But the Ninevites believe when the Jews and the Christians don't. 
That's why it's easier to deal with somebody who's a full blown sinner than to deal with somebody who's just churched. Because they believe they're better than somebody else. And when you're better, when you think you're better than somebody else because of something like this, you're not better because you're saved. You're better because God saved you. Salvation is in his hand. Read. We almost done. We almost get to chapter two. Go ahead. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way. Their deeds. So I guess God didn't register their deeds as being evil because they did it in faith. They had no relationship to the true and living God. They were Jews. So the only way they could do the sackcloth ashes and all the things that they did and turn from their wicked ways, they said, maybe God will repent. They did it by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Go ahead. Then God relented concerning mm -hmm. the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. Mm -hmm. And he did not do it. And he didn't do it. You know, Jonah matters a bear now. I would be, you mean that you saved me, and I'm thinking probably you saved me to crowd against this city because you wanted it destroyed, and it's turned around that you didn't want to destroy it. You wanted to save what I hated. You wanted to save the people that I hate. The people that have been so evil to the Jewish nation, you want to save them? They're not Jews, they're heathens. They're not like us, they're heathens. And you want to save the worst of the worst? Well, I want to challenge you in this. Because I know we're in chapter 2 now, right? That was the end of chapter 3. Ah, good. So, think about this. Jonah has now watched God save the people of Nineveh. And he's unhappy. And we're going to see how, much, how bad he is unhappy. And now we have a situation where, if you think about the blood of Jesus, saints of God, I want you to be careful when you say some things about people not being able to be saved. Because if there's one person on this planet, no matter what they've done, that cannot be saved by the blood of Jesus, then we're wasting our time. I don't care what you think. I don't care your emotional, your emotional attachment to it. If the blood of Jesus doesn't cover every sin that man could possibly do, then it's, we're wasting our time. Because who, who, who determines if his blood didn't cover mine? See, so we're going to see how bad Jonah is. Go ahead. Yeah, go on to chapter 4. We're going to finish up today. But it greatly displeased Jonah, mm -hmm. and he became angry. Jonah became angry. Jonah got mad. What? Hold on, hold on. You done gave me the message twice that they were going to get destroyed, and you didn't destroy them? All because they, they listened to me? And I've seen calamity come upon Israel. But Israel, you didn't listen. As we read in Matthew, I would have gathered you, but you didn't listen. You killed all the prophets. You harmed the, your own kinsmen and didn't listen to me. That's why you go into captivity. That's why you have your problem, saints. You're not listening to God. And when God decides to use you on the enemy that you hate the most to save them, you get mad. Because you're like, how dare you? Use me to save the person that I hate. Who are you? He's God. He's trying to wake you up. The Ninevites are fine. He's still dealing with Jonah. Jonah still got issues. Jonah still doesn't love who God loves. Jonah hates who God loves. And that's another thing, saints. We got to love who God loves. And God loves to save the sinner. He don't save saints. He saved sinners. Jesus ate with sinners. And the religious establishment talked about him and eventually crucified him because he was not the God of their imagination. He was the God that's a saving God and that's a merciful God and is a gracious God. Go ahead. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to Forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. So in other words, he said, he said this back before we got started. You was going to send me on a mission to condemn him, but I already knew that you was going to save him. 
But I didn't want to go. That's why I went to Tarshish. Because I knew you was a loving God. I knew that you was a gracious God. I knew that you was a merciful God. I didn't want to go talk to them over there because I knew that you wanted to say that. I wanted you to punish them because they hurt me. They came against me. How many people did you want punished because they hurt you? And God is saying, I'm trying to use you who's hurt to save them. You go from being the victim to the victor. See, it is easy to be the victim. Why me? I'm going through. But how much more do you show that you're Christ-like when you take the victim out of the equation and become the victor and say, no matter what has happened to me, but God. Because he's left me here, he wants me to witness to my enemy that they might be saved. It doesn't take away from the natural consequences of their actions. Because in damn, they're going to get destroyed because they, guess what? They're going to go back. God's not going to send nobody else. He gave them one chance. He's not going to send nobody else. They're going to get destroyed. But not at the, at the voice of, of Jonah, but at the will of God. Go ahead. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. So Jonah now wishes that his life... Be taken from him because he mad. I think about this. Jonah mad because God saved. Go ahead. For death is better to me than life. Now he wasn't saying that when he was in the fish. That caught me like, okay, you wasn't saying death is better than life when he was in the fish. You had the same mission. So why is it now that, that, that you are upset because God did something that you didn't want to do it and that you thought and you knew that, hold on, you said that you knew that he was going to do this so why are you upset? That's how egotistical man is. Even though we know that God is merciful and gracious when he shows it to a person that we don't think deserve it, we get upset because we say they don't deserve it. Go ahead. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? He said, do you, do you have a reason? What is your reason to be angry? Do you have a good reason to be angry? What did he say then? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. Now can you imagine Jonah huffing out the city? God asked a question. He didn't ask. He didn't answer. God did. He? he said, "Do you have a good reason to be angry?" And I can imagine Jonah stomping out the city. Yeah. Okay. Wait, because the forty days hadn't happened yet. So he hoping they slip up. Go ahead. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So Jonah had to be elevated above the city to see what would happen in that great city. Yeah. So he built him a little hut and sat under it. A little shelter because it was hot. Yeah. Go ahead. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. Now, God gave Jonah a mission and a word. Jonah went in the wrong direction. God brought a fish. Then, no, God brought a storm. Then God brought a fish. Then God put him on dry land. Then God gave him a message a second time. Jonah went and did what God wanted to do. Yeah. Jonah gets mad and wishes to die. Yeah. And now God gives him shade in the middle of his anger. He gives him relief. He shows him mercy and grace another time and provides relief for him in the midst of his anger. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Jonah is sinning because he is wishing that God destroy Nineveh. But he already knows that God is going to be merciful to them. Go ahead. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plan. Oh, now Jonah happy. Now, 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 now pay attention to saints. Jonah is happy about something that God did for him, that God was trying to do for them. Now Jonah's happy about the relief God has given him in the plant that gives him comfort, shade, protection. God wanted to provide salvation for them. What God wanted Jonah to see is, I am the author of salvation. I am the author of comfort. Just like I saved them and used you, I raised for plant, and we're going to find out that you didn't labor for, but you're happy that you get relief because I did it. So why can't you be just as happy for the Ninevites who I decide to love and save? Go ahead. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. Mm -hmm. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint 
and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. The third time he begging for death. Go ahead. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand, as well as many animals? And we leave you right there. God showed compassion on Nineveh for the sake of the children. Because men and women, adults, know their left hand from their right. Children don't. Babies don't. And what God did was say, I'm not going to hold the evil of your parents against you. I'm going to give you an opportunity, the next generation, to walk in the story of your parents accepting Jesus, accepting God. And so do we. Do we have any reason to be mad when God decides to save someone? Do we have any reason to, is God as good as God has been to us and sheltered us and kept us from harm's way? Do we have any reason to believe that somebody can't be a sinner and come to Christ? Do we have any reason to look down on those who slip and fall and may fall back into sin but want to get delivered? He delivered Jonah and he delivered Nineveh and God will continue to deliver you. How much more are you expected to be that loving person, that kind person that gives someone the gospel? That's so gracious and, and understanding and long-suffering. And you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And, and even though you didn't die for the fruit, Jesus died so you can have this fruit. That you can display it to other people. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You have the power to forgive. You have the power to forget. And you have the power to raise up through the gospel. And you have to take advantage of that. You have to decide today that you are going to be obedient and do what God has called you to do. And not put people in harm's way. And realize God is most gracious to those who are the most evil. He's the most gracious. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So with knowing that, we need to govern ourselves accordingly in light of what's going on in this world today. In light of what's going on in the United States today, right now, we need to be the ones who show the grace in the midst of the sin. Because if we decide to let the sin govern our emotions and decide that some people should die and some people should live and some people should get harmed, then my question is, aren't you being just like Jonah, being presumptive? God lets people live for a reason, and God has you here for a reason. And maybe, just maybe, your reason is you're going to give the gospel to somebody that you hate to say they saw. Just think about that. All right, then. That's the end of today's lesson in Jonah. We will get back. Does anybody have any questions or comments?